Hey there, welcome. Um, today is about my PhD thesis. I want to make a quick English video about uh, what I did there. And it's based on my defense uh, presentation, so it's automatically translated. Don't uh, expect um, failure-free presentation or a failure-free translation at any time. But if you have questions, please let me know. So what I, wa what I was doing the last uh, couple of years was I tried to search for a way how to integrate the topology and shape optimization into a process. The process is the digital design. And I did that on an example of trust structures. Why trust structures? Um, you will see in a minute. But uh, that's, that's more or less the, the topic. Okay, let's jump into it. One second. All point working. Yeah, so first of all, digital design. If you have topology optimization somewhere in there, uh, the traditional or state of the art way how to include this is you have a design space which is built manually then you have a topology optimization you have to build a model for that then you have to interpret it and reconstruct it in order to get a geometry back if you don't do it with 3d printing for 3d printing an stl file may be enough but if you want to do it uh, maybe a shape optimization parameter wise um, you should or you you are um yeah <laughs> You have to reconstruct it as a geometry and yeah so the, the main points are here so um, design space is built manually so um, the engineer goes to that um, design he has to do and looks for uh, certain ways where can I put material and where can't I put material and those areas where he cannot or she cannot put material he uh, left that out after design space. So you see the holes in here. So for example, I don't know, mouse, yeah. Okay, so you see here, this is um, where the motors go for a Segway. And here's some steering components. So, and, and then you have a topology optimization, which gives you a structural proposal and you have to interpret it. And this is partially automated. There are some tools um, which claim to have a fully functional geometry reconstruction approach, but this comes with most of most of them come with a downside. So it's not really parameterized, but just a a 3D hull around um, the the, stru the structured proposal. And it's also limited to just doing geometric interpretation, because what I want to suggest later on is um, to use physics-based interpretation because you have stress, stress states and it makes sense to use physics-based interpretation for a physics-related problem. All right, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, now uh, knowledge representation uh, using a scooter as an example. So you have a scooter as a product, right? Uh, it has different components like batteries, engines, wheels, control units, the frame, um, but different uh, components as well, model-wise. Uh, you, you want to perform a topology optimization, then stiffness is important, the material selection is important. Uh, networking uh, is important. <laughs> what was networking? I think this should mean mesh. <laughs> yeah. Load case is important and yeah, you have SPC and, and forces acting at a static load case, but it's just a, a small, 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 tiny, um, tiny bit of the model complexity you can achieve in such a uh, yes yeah, scenario but there are different topics as well you have maybe have uh, some multi uh, dynamics with grounds joints um, drives you have control units you have investment uh, you you have costs manufacturing costs so you have the picture here you have different disciplines and all relate to that product scooter and software wise that today's the situation is that you have lots of lots of interfaces, right? So uh, you have uh, software like maybe HyperMesh Hyper and it wants a step file or geometry file. This comes from maybe Siemens, Siemens NX or um, ANS is the same way. Or you have to do maybe some calculations in MATLAB and export that into a, another solver, etc. You have lots of interfaces. And one idea to, to get down the complexity and also um, reduce the errors because of non-synchronized models is to use a central data model and there's the information, a single source of truth, you could say, 
and from that source of truth all the models are fed. So they take in the knowledge or the data from the central data model and then build their model script driven. So it's a, a huge topic and if you want to go into that you can. Um, Graph-based design languages is sort of the, the one, one of those concepts, how to do this. And you can search that and you will find lots of lots of papers um, further defining or yeah, detailing this approach. Now back to the scooter. Um, we have the central data model in the middle. So where a scooter once was standing. <laughs> and then you put all this information into there. All right, and um, now if you have this central data model, it's really complex. And to build it, a so-called design compiler is used. It's not my work. I haven't built the design compiler, but I was using it. And the approach is that you have the design compiler building your central data model, and from the central data model, you have model-to-text transformations, which builds uh, your, your uh, domain-specific models at the end. So the domain models could be a finite element model, for example, or a topology optimization model, which sort of is uh, on top of a finite element model, but also geometry, CAD models, uh, cost models, something in MATLAB, you name it. So it's different domains, different models, and they all relate or they all search from this central data model because there's the information. And this is all machine generated. So you could imagine that clicking once and then your domain specific tool opens and all the commands are run to build this domain specific model automatically. So you no, don't go, oh, hypermesh, create component, create property, assign property to component, create um, geometry, create mesh. Now this is done with TCL scripting. And so you have at each iteration, you can just say, all right, I did this design change and now I want to see my finite element model again, click run through, and then you have it. It's a different approach of thinking for the engineering design and has a lot of advantages, but also disadvantages, because uh, if, it gets, if it gets more complex, then um, maybe some routines are not implemented yet, and you have to deal that for yourself. So just to take it with a grain of salt, I'm not proposing you heaven here, but it's um, for academic model, it's quite if you can reach it because suddenly everything works automatically and then you can do something like round trip engineering taking the information back looping it once again create another um, variant and evaluate this as well but yeah this is more or less the overview for, for the design compiler which uh, creates this central data model but the question is how how on earth can the central uh, data model be built by this design compiler how can you instruct him to do this? And um, the way it's done, it's using languages, graph-based design languages. So you have voc vocabulary and rules because that's what a language is composed of. And those vocabulary and, and rules, those are coming from a dictionary, you could say, uh, from a source. This could be uh, described as ontologies or collections um, of um, yeah, vocabulary. So. What's the vocabulary here? Uh, for the scooter, I don't know if it's an example here. No, sorry. For, for the scooter, for example, all those things which are shown here, those are vocabularies of the scooter. So the topology optimization, it's an entity. Or a battery, it's an entity. And you can instantiate entities and fill it with parameters and, and you can change parameters and build your central data model by also using rules. Rules, those are how you build it together. For example, that you build the wheels onto the motors and not onto the frame, for example. And so you have engineering rules, engineering, yeah, it's a grammar. It's more or less a grammar, a design grammar. But think of those ontologies on the left side just as libraries. Or if, you're no, if you know programming, you use libraries, code of different persons you don't know, but you can use their code to um, improve your own code. And sort of, it's sort of like this here. So I built, for example, an ontology for finite element methods and also for topology optimization. And so some new engineer can use those ontologies for their model. It's just a library. 
All right, but it's saved as a design knowledge and you can use this. All right, I, I don't want to go that deep into that road because yeah, it's a lot of things we want to talk about. So, um, but having the central, central data model, I show here two um, topology wise different models, you know? So the, the one bar has a hole in here and the other doesn't, but it has a hole from one side. So they're topology wise different. But you can um, just make them with one click in your approach. So this is just to show more or less um, that you can build many models, also topology, topology, topology wise different um, with, with a single click. Not that easy for everything, but it's in, in this general approach, it's possible. It's possible. And yeah, you can imagine where this leads. This leads to that you can evaluate a multitude of variants very quickly. And this is uh, one main advantage of this whole approach. So we did a example for some uh, multi-copter. So we had topology uh, optimization, optimization here. And we did um, different ways of putting the battery. So you could align the battery with uh, the point in the middle and the motor. So here, this is where a motor sits, right? And there you have your force acting. And you see now here, those are the cutouts for batteries. Here it's not aligned, right? But we have the aligned model and the not aligned model. This is the not aligned model. Aligned model would be cutouts like this and this and this and this. So, um, and then also you can change the height of the cutouts. Maybe you want to put the batteries at this height, at this height. You don't know at first. But then you make your topology optimization models and then you can evaluate also for parameters you didn't even include in your topology optimization model. Because, for example, center of gravity was not a parameter here, could have been. I know Hypermesh can use also those kind of things, but it was not included here as a, as a design parameter, but it can be evaluated afterwards in this design process. And so you can list all your variants, all what you have done. For example, um, <laughs> I don't know what this is. Focus, me. oh God, this is a translation error. Um, on the x-axis you have compliance and so there's the, the parameter comp compliance everyone is minimizing in topolo topology optimization and on the other hand you have volume that's correct uh, and focus this should be the center of gravity right and you have um, you want to have a lower center of gravity and that's where you can see the different groups you see uh, on this side um, this is the group with the non-aligned, so, and this is the one with the aligned, but I'm not 100% sure, it has been a while. But this is, uh, you can find this on papers, this is published. I think so, aligned topology optimization model, off, enter, no, I don't know anymore. All right, now let's come to trust structures. Trust structures can be found anywhere. In engineering design, you find it by grains, you have the, the power lines, you have buildings, you have and this, a glider. And uh, truss structures are pretty lightweight because you put only trusses there where you want to have loads transferred. Right, so um, it's, it's a lightweight structure. And just to have some definitions here, you have a start and an end of a rod and you have so-called connection nodes, where different rods uh, join together. And then you have, for example, underbelts, upper belts, di diagonal elements, etc. And now is the question, how can the structure proposal of a trust structure can be automatically translated into a parameter parametrized CAD geometry? So how do you get from the um, structural proposal of a topology optimization to a parametrized CAD model. And now this is the main part of the topic. Um, so integrating the topo topology and shape optimization. So first of all, optimization, what is this? Um, optimization is the search for a better version, right? And you do this until, until you cannot find any better version. Now regarding engineering, you have different 
things you can play around with. So for example, if you want to build a bridge, you can choose different construction methods. You can also choose different materials and those in, uh, this co correlate more or less. You cannot build a bridge the same way you build it with composites as with steel. This is a whole different topic because the material behaves differently. Now, going a, a little bit back uh, down here, you have uh, topology optimization. Topology optimization searches for different ways of placing the structural elements. Also, the number is changed. Form optimization just uh, moves the outer boundaries of a structure. And sizing changes parameters of cross sections, for example. And so you have the different ways of optimization uh, around here. I want to stick li a little bit with it, with it here. So topology optimization is you are really free. You can do really much regarding the structure. You can create new holes or remove some holes. You can also, a topology optimization also includes the form and the sizing optimization because uh, it also defines where the nodes are and also defines how thick the structures are. So um, topology optimization has the highest um, possibilities of all, so the highest potential. Form optimization is below that and sizing it's below even that because sizing you just change some minor detail, details but can have an influence, definitely. Okay, now um, the focus for this presentation is, is on topology and form optimization and now Famous question, what is this topology optimization? Talked about uh, for whatever, half an hour, about an hour, um, and didn't even define what it is. So topology optimization, as you, as a, as a, um, as a subscriber or watcher of this channel, I assume that you already know that, but let me just briefly, briefly um, show you the, design, uh, the, the, the details of it. Okay, so you have your design space and you have your structural proposal. This topology optimization makes one thing. It, first of all, um, discretizes your design space with elements, right? So you have a lot of elements in your design space. And for each element, it tries to de decide if it's part of the structure or not a part of the structure. And if it's not part of a structure, then it's called a hole. So it's, yeah, it's a void, right? So for each and every element, it decides that. And how does this process happen? You have this so-called um, density, which is not a physical density, but it's more or less acting like that because it scales different things. It scales the volume as the physical density does in sort of a way, um, but, but it, also def uh, it also scales the stiffness. So you see it here. So the stiffness of one element <coughs> is equal to the design, uh, the density, so the design variable, this is the density of, the, of this element, um, time, times a power, times it's wrong, to the power of a penalty factor, this is correct, not times, it's, it's uh, to the power of, of p, and p is a penalty constant, and, and this is the, elasticity module um, of the material. So for steel, this would be 210,000 MPAs. Now, and this is um, the volume, sorry, the volume here. Okay, now the optimization is, um, is formulated as a two, two phrase thing. <laughs> so first of all, there's something you want to optimize. Some parameter, some property, property is a better word, some property you want to minimize or maximize. In this case, we want to minimize, this is embarrassing, medium indulgence, I have to change it right here on the spot. This, I cannot see that. I'm sorry, I should have checked it. This is the mean compliance. So the mean compliance is um, some sort of the, 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 the amount of work which is done in the, in the structure. And you want to minimize that because you see it, 
at here, you see that it is equal to one half times the loads times their displacements. And load times displacement, this is sort of the work definition because force time times displacement, that's the work, the work done into the structure. And you want to minimize that. So wherever you have high load, you want to have a mini minimizing or uh, mini minimum of a displacement. And this is a stiff behavior, you know, let's, let's um, see if you have your um, steel bar between your two hands and you want to try to break it by pulling it away from each other, it would be very tough. But if you do that with chewy gum, it's, um, yeah, it's very easy because it's not stiff. Stiff means that it has a high force related to the displacement or a small displacement related to the force. Okay, so we want to make a stiff design. This is more or less what stands here with mean compliance. But um, I said it was a two phrase thing with the optimization because you, if you just have this, minimize my compliance, maximize the stiffness. Well, easy, just put all the elements and fill the whole design space, done. Because that's the trivial solution. If you use every and each and every element of the design space, then it's the most stiff design you can ever create with this design space. But you don't want that because uh, you care about weight. <laughs> so you have a, a second phrase and this the second sentence here is that you're restricting the volume. You restrict the volume as a um, coefficient. And this is the volume frac, it's the fraction of the of the design space volume. And if you have um, zero three in this case, <laughs> this German means, uh, for example, so if you have the volume fraction should be less than 0 0.3. This means that you only have 30% of the volume at the final design. Okay. All right, so you go through that optimization process. You have your design space, you have your structural proposal, and now what? You have to think of a way to get the topology extracted out of there. And now comes the juicy part. Um, there are several ways of doing this with geometric um, properties. For example, you can replicate it with primitives. So you have some primitives, some cubes, some cylinders, for example, and you want to try to fit them that they cover uh, at, at, at cover the design space. So in that fashion, that where the high density elements are, there is your primitive and where holes are, there are no non primitives. And this is achieved here, you see those little cubes here, which are in the structure, those tend to reconstruct this. It's, it's rather poorly, but it's an, it's an, a valid approach. The other thing is you will maybe want to do it with ISO lines. This means you go into your model and search for lines with equal density. And if you do this, you can um, find them and close loops with them and you find your holes and your outer structure. It's a perfect approach. It's really good because if you want to make it out of a sheet metal, for example, it's perfect because you have your cuts and then you give it to a, a laser cutter or whatever and you get your geometry. Maybe you want to smooth it a little bit because, because of the discretization, it's like it's not smooth and maybe you want to do this. And another thing is you may extract the topology by thinning. So you delete the elements from outside to the inside, and then you're left with one string of elements. And this is more or less a representation of the topology. And also very um, popular is this uh, reconstruction with so-called NURBS. NURBS are a way of mathematically uh, describing surfaces with those Poly polygons around it, so control polygons, and it's a yeah, it's a, it's a good way to get structures. For example, for a later three D printing operation, or yeah, something like that. Okay. Um, now, what I did was the physics based, the physics based clustering approach. Now I want to rush through there because yeah, I don't know if you want to spare the the whole time with me talking here about my PhD thesis, but I, I will watch through there. And if there are questions, you know what to do. So we have, what data do we use? 
That's important. What data do we have available and can we use for this separation? So we have the element densities. Well, pretty obvious. But we also have elements. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's oh, I, I thought I got everything, but I'm very sorry about that. Um, it's not element voltages, but I hope this made you laugh. It's element stresses. Yeah, shame on you, PowerPoint. And shame on me for not properly checking it. So you have your element densities and you have your element stresses, right? And element stresses, that's, that's what, it make, what makes it physics-based because we will, uh, we will wander around <laughs> this topic quite a bit. So a stress tensor, you see that here, you maybe seen that in textbooks, but you can transform it into the principal stresses. And, and yeah, main stresses, if it's main stresses is a translation error, it's principal stress, but you know what, what this is. So um, you can classify your elements by the relations of the main of the principal stresses to each other. And okay, you have maybe have a uniaxial stress state, a biaxial stress state or a triaxial stress state. But um, I care more just about the uh, uniaxial and multiaxial stress states because what this allows me to do to, um, to differentiate between beam elements or bar, beam, bar, rod elements and linkage elements. See that in a minute here. You have the C clip here. And you see there is some bar structures. This is all the stuff in green. And then you have the black elements those are the linkage elements, right? Those are where several um, beam structure, truss structures come together. And you also have this for 3D, it's the same thing, same thing. At the joints, you have the multi axial stress states. Now you can use that, right? So for each element, you go and you just search for the principal stresses and then you search for the absolute greatest stress that's not the greatest but the, in, in absolute terms because you have negative uh, principal stresses because tension is positive compression is negative but if you have an element which is high in compression then you want definitely sigma uh, three and not one now you have the dominant stress the dominant principal stress. And for this stress, you have also a stress vector. And you do this for each and every element. And this is pretty cool. Um, now here, principal stress vectors, you see this, uh, what I want to show with this slide is that the linkages, you see that this is meeting here, right? Here, uh, there the, uh, the stress comes from this direction and there from this direction. And here in the linkage zones, you see this overlay, right? There. This is because this is why there is a multi axial stress state in here. And it's the same for 3D as well. Now, um, okay, where was I? Okay. Now you can see this a little more clear. I don't know if or this would be, okay. Now this is the main slide and this is probably where it gets most complicated. So you have your stress vectors. Stress vectors are the stress vectors each element on the dominant stress, dominant principal stress. You transfer this into polar coordinates. And those polar coordinates allow you to just get rid of one dimension. It makes it easier to cluster. And if you just draw it on this 2D example, it's easy because you can draw it on a polar di diagram and see if you just make just like a cake, make slices and look in which slice you element count is high, this is one way or one, one direction, one, di <laughs> one direction where a beam is pointing to. See this here with the arrows. See with one, this is that little slice. And if you look very closely, very closely, there's a little, little, little um, value count right besides it. But we don't care about this because we want to just get those elements together, which correspond to the same beam, same structural beam. Now this is done with just a simple um, histogram approach, just check for maxima, and then you have that.
for 2D is even easier to see because you can visualize it as a one chart. But for a 3D dimension, you have the second um, angle and the polar coordinates as well. So it gets a matrix. And in the matrix, you just search for maxima. And if you found your maxima, you just conquer the elements around it to it. And yeah, that's, that's sort of it. So you can cluster this perfectly, most of it, more or less perfectly. Yeah, sure, you have to tidy it up a little bit here from, from left to right, that's for sure. And you find the linkages again and define that a little bit more. But, uh, and also here, if you're wondering what in the hell is this, this comes because there were boundary conditions. And the way it works that it also um, differentiates or make a, makes a separation in boundary conditions. So this is just how the algorithm works. But yeah, this is about it. And now you can see, um, <laughs> oh my God, ah, it's such, such, such a shame. But you, you see, I'm, I'm not, I'm hoping you forgive me for that errors here. I just didn't have to have the time to just go properly through it and checking every single thing. So physics stress based, this is the result here. And you can see even here, it's a, a slide off. It, it suggested that this would be another cluster, but it was resolved as a linking cluster at the end. A little bit hard to see, but those are black linkage clusters and that's a really dark beam cluster in here. Now you can do it with other methods as well. And this was my first thought. <laughs> Just use what's there, right? K-means is a proper choice for um, structuring or clustering. Uh, things like that. So if you have your me metho methodology, 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 yeah, you know, your methods. <laughs> if you have this method and your algorithm working, then you can also use clustering methods like k-means or maybe also the other one. I forget how it was. Um, dbscan. dbscan is even better. So dbscan has less errors, uh, but also a few. So I just want to prove here that my one is the better. No. <laughs> no. It's just the physics based is is good. It's it's really good. So it's it, it doesn't have to hide itself because uh, k-means is so much better, so much faster. And the current state uh, k-means is faster, but also a lot more inaccurate. And db scan is kind of in the middle. It's not that accurate, but it's also not that fast. But it's more accurate as the k-means. Um, now, if you have this clustered and then you can do your topology extraction just by the neighbor relationships, you just go and, all right, you have this beam element and this beam element connects to linkage zone one and two. Which other beam elements connects also to this linkage element? And so you get this graph. This is a topology extraction. And with that, you can then go one step further and make a geometry of the interpreta interpretation. This is on, on this term, it's rather simplistic because you just want to make a make just cylinders in here. Because what you can now can do is you can do a form optimization, form, form. the shape optimization. You can do a shape optimization. And this shape optimization just has to deal with self intersection and also intersection with the outer of the design space. You don't want your beam elements go what the heck around the world. No, you want to stay them in, in your design space. And if they don't do that, if they don't do that, you want to penalize this and you can. So this is one way I advance this a little bit further. So you have a shape optimization approach directly linked at the end of the topology optimization approach. And then you can check for self, um, piercing i don't know if it's piercing but you know self-intersection yeah intersection is a better word the self-intersection and intersection with the outer world which you don't want to do and penalize this in a shape optimization and finally finally you have your geometry model so more or less here you have it just with the cylinders but you want to make a welder tube and you can and um, in this case we just or i just made this uh, very simple simple so for every each and every connection you go there and you search for the two tubes which have the least difference angle to 180 degree so 
it's the straightest way you can go through that connection. And those two pipes, those are just cut it twice and welded together. And all other tubes are just welded on top of it. So in this case here, those two, this is the through pipe. I, I have been told this is the way in English it sounds, but uh, it sounds like a little bit awkward, but the through pipe. And then you weld this thing on top of that. So you make it adjustments here to this tube and then weld it on top of that. And this goes around here because it's just with two cuts on each tube once. Right, and this is more or less the finish, right? Because at this stage you can also um, accommodate, accommodate is a great word. So you also can check for your um, manufacturing costs and times because you have everything in here. You have you have the welding lengths, and if you have the welding lengths with a with your machine data, you can transfer that to costs. And then sort of, I want to draw the picture here. It's not that accurate and not that um, detailed yet, but I want to draw this picture that if you have done this effort. At the end of the day, you have a whole model, which includes all of these parameters. And when you build it from once from start to finish, you can then enhance and enjoy the benefits of having this model at your hands, on your hands, at, at hands. And then you can just make it a thousand variations and check where's the best variation, best variant. All right, this is more or less it. Now, um, what is this? So this is more or less the summary. So we have automated creation and investigation of the design space, <laughs> the policy optimization, then automated physics-based interpretation, and the automated reconstruction and also cost evaluation. Yeah, we can do that for several. Um, this is means outlook. So. We have the problem that um, some plates which have 2D stress state or two dimensional or tr uh, biaxial stress state, um, they are not recognized very well as beam structures. They aren't. But how can you detect those structures as well and in integrate these with your trust structures? This could be a, a next step. And I know the guys working also on this as well. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, leave a like, leave a comment, leave a subscription. I will be happy, happy if you do that. And um, yeah, first of all, thanks for staying around this long. And yeah, so if you have questions, just go ahead. And I hope this video helps to just see what I did there in the top in this uh, PhD. And if you're interested in that. All right, take care. Goodbye.